make it. All right, there we go. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's so, so awesome. It's the first session of the of the eight week mindfulness program, plus six weeks of teacher training. If for those of you that want to carry on with that part of the, the training and um, before we get into it, I thought maybe we could just do a little settling practice, a little meditation, a little mindfulness practice. And it is the foundation practice, okay? Um, and it's a breath practice. So we can just move into the moment and um, let go of today, let go of any expectation and just bring ourselves more into this moment. So uh, to start off with, we place two feet firmly on the ground so that we can feel a little bit grounded. And uh, just dropping the chin slightly. And if you like, you can just lower your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes. And um, we're just going to start off with three beautiful deep breaths. Okay, so breathing in through the nose, nice and deeply. And slowly exhaling out the nostrils with control. And again, breathing in through the nostrils. And slowly exhaling out the nose. Last big breath in. Opening the mouth, gently sigh the breath out. And now a natural breath, if you can, at the nostrils. So just follow the breath. We are focusing on one thing and that's our breath. And there may be other distractions that are going on, noises. Uh, your phone might be beeping. Just let go of whatever else is going on and make your breath the most important thing in, in your whole world right now. This is a process of attention management. And of being present. The breath is our anchor into this moment. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. Relax, relax, relax. Let go of today. Let go of tomorrow. And come home to the present. There's nowhere to go and nothing else to do.
Okay, let's end this with another deep breath in. And sigh the breath out. Thank you for doing that practice with me. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could start everything just with a, a pause, you know, pause on purpose. Our lives are so busy and so hectic that to pause is a revolution in itself, isn't it? Um, so for those of you that don't know me, and I think you all do, my name's Mark Joseph, and um, I'm a director in Mindful Revolution, which is our corporate company. This is uh, part of a Mindful Mentors project, which is my own um, business. And even though it links to Mindful Revolution beautifully, um, I, I still have my sort of outside offerings. Uh, this is the teacher training program. And I started this program in 2016 in a yoga studio in Joburg called Living Yoga. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I, my ex-wife was a yoga teacher and she was doing a yoga teacher training and I thought, why, why, why is there no mindfulness teacher training? You know, there's so many yoga teacher trainings. Why is there no mindfulness teacher training? There was nothing around really at that time. So I put it together. But I've been teaching mindfulness and meditation since 2001. Um, I, 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 my interest in, in meditation and mindfulness was born out of um, panic and anxiety in my, in my early 20s. Um, my father unfortunately lost his um, his mental health, it became depressed, and then that moved into schizophrenia, bipolar, and uh, his eventual suicide. And then my mental health after his death was also very bad, and my mom's mental health is not good. So I'm not very mentally well, actually. Um, but I was really blessed to have met a person back in 95 who taught me mindfulness. And in those days, it wasn't a thing, you know. Um, uh, she taught me breath work and I called her a shrink. And I, I thought that my mom was wasting her money because she wasn't talking, she wasn't getting me really to talk about my problems or my feelings. She was just really teaching me t uh, proactive techniques that I could do for my anxiety. I was having between 10 and 15 anxiety panic attacks a day, which was highly abnormal. And um, obviously everybody was trying to encourage me to take uh, medication. And I didn't take the medication because my father was on uh, lots and lots of tablets and it didn't work for him. So not to say that they don't work, it just I just at that time felt very angry with pharmaceuticals. And yes, uh, my attitude has changed as time has progressed, but I still believe that if we practice mindfulness daily and we do some exercise and we eat right, that these are the first things that we should be doing before we, uh, before we go and get the prescription. Um, and I'm not against the prescription either. But, you know, it's like, physical fitness, we've got to go to the gym, we've got to work out, we can't take a tablet and expect to be fit physically. We've got to do some work, right? We've got to get our heart rate going, we've got to sweat a little bit. And for those of you that do exercise, it becomes enjoyable. And in the same way, mindfulness and meditation might feel um, difficult in the beginning. But then when you get into the groove, and, you know, we got eight weeks and after eight weeks, this is the time period that uh, neuroscientists say that um, an eight week program, a, a neuroscientist can start to see visible changes in your brain because of um, your mindfulness practice. All it takes is eight weeks and your brain already starts to visibly rewire itself and grow. Isn't that remarkable? So the brain is a muscle. Um, just like any other body part. And yeah, I, I guess uh, when I put this training together, it was um, quite experimental. 
And then I've, I, I came across a, a neuroscience article in, in uh, uh, what year was it? Um, 20, uh, 2019 from the Max Planck Institute of Neuroscience that said, if you want to build your brain in this area, you've got to do these practices and build your brain in the other area, these practices and so on and so on. And I looked at the practices I put together and it was exactly the same as what Max Planck Institute was recommending. So I was jumping for joy because I, I felt that these practices were the correct practices to put together. And it was verified uh, from a very recognized um, German neuroscience lab. And I will be sharing the research with you as well so that you can read it and go through it. Um, I'm not going to be sort of uh, uh, really hearing your story or your introductions uh, next week. Next week, we, we all we're going to be doing is just hearing about your journey. Okay, that's going to be the class next week. But I thought we could just check in um, and uh, as we go on, like, how are you feeling on a scale of, say, uh, one, one to ten? Right. Um, <laughs> I'm about a, a seven today, seven out of ten. Um, I know that the rain is cool and we need the weather, but I, I always feel a little bit like gloomy when it's cold and, and rainy and wet. <laughs> so I'm about, a, I'm about an eight or a nine out of ten. Um, so I thought maybe we could start um, with Kathy Tennyson. Kathy, what's your number today? Do you mind sharing with us? Um, I'm actually, I'm a 10. I'm super wow. excited to be here. Um, I've learned over the years to accept the weather, the weather changes that comes and goes. And uh, I think something that I've learned, taught myself is not to let my surroundings influence my inner. And yes, it's raining, tomorrow the sun will shine. But I think I'm a 10 because I'm super excited to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Nice, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, Kerry, let's check in with you. Uh, what's your number today? Sure. Um, so mine is not as high as Kathy's. I'd say probably around a five or a six. Um, I lost my gran a few days ago, so we've been busy in the process of planning her memorial and dealing with all of that. Sorry to hear that, my condolences for the loss. Yeah. Um, that's very sad, but um, yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Thanks, Kerry, for checking in. Sure. Uh, Anna Marie, I'm uh, going to come over to you. How, how's your number today? Uh, Mark, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm a nine. I'm also super excited, and I was really looking forward to this evening. And uh, I'm actually, I love the rain, and um, you know. Everything just gets green, and so um, I'm all open and excited. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna-Marie. Yes, I love the rain too. I mean, we need it, right? It's so important. Mm. And we've, we've actually had quite a dry summer, if you think about mm. it. Um, Nicole, you're in, you're in the Cape, right? Nicole Mansour? Yes, I am. I'm in Cape Town. Yes, I'm um, so, Yes. Um, been a, an extremely windy and rainy past 24 hours. Uh -huh. um, but we've been, I'm very lucky, we've been in quite a protected area, unbelievably. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm very happy to be here and lovely to meet everybody. I'm going to check in with, I mean, I'm going to say 9.5. Um, yeah, just a beautifully rich day. Um, and really, yeah, life is good. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing, Nicole. 9.5. I mean, how's that for awareness, right? You even you even got a 0.5 in there. So it's like HD definition of mind. You, you're really <laughs> super aware. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, with a, with a grassy grass. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I'm an 8.5. 8 I had a, thank you. I had a really great day, especially with admin matters at work and 
we're kicking things at the park. Oh, uh, so good. I was quite chuffed about that. <laughs> nice. Thank you. What a Monday. Yeah, nice start yes. to the week. Absolutely. And did you spend time on the farm this weekend? Yes, I did. Um, and I also learned how to ride a bee pond, drive my car in thick mud, <laughs> much to my brother's amusement. Okay. When I arrived there, the mud was quite high and it was raining. And I drove slowly and then my car would slide ever so slowly to the right. Then I'd drive some more and then it would slide to the left. And when I got into the farmhouse, he said, oh, I see you, you're practicing. So I said, I suppose I am. Thank you for coming out and coaching me. <laughs> and he said, but I would have got wet. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, all good. Thank you. Well, well done. It sounds like an advanced driving course that you went through. Spontaneous. It did feel like that. It did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Nicole Temlet, um, how's your number today? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm about a seven today. I think work is quite stressful at the moment. We're busy finalizing audits. And I was either too lazy or just didn't have the right motivation today to do my exercise, which I'm disappointed in myself about. But I'm excited to be here tonight. Feeling a little bit tired, but good to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I'm also didn't exercise today so um but but give us give you give ourselves a break right it's it's okay we'll <laughs> it's okay uh thanks nicole it sounds like work's been uh, interesting and last but not least rose let's check in with you <laughs> I think I'm, I'm about a six. Um, just also feeling a bit fatigued today because I worked all the weekend. Okay. Had exams last week, so just a bit tired, but a strong six. A strong six, but feeling a bit tired. Okay. Thanks, Rose. That's awesome. Um, thank you, everyone, for checking. A little bit of vulnerability there, you know. It's like, oh, I have to sort of say my number and why and I, I didn't expect you to say why but you did anyway so i can see we're going to have a very deep experience because um you seem to be quite open everyone seems to be open i've noticed that there's no men on this uh, on this group um <laughs> i've got another i've got another uh, group on thursday and i think there's one or two guys there but mindfulness seems really popular with the ladies um, and I don't know. I don't know where the men are. I think women are leading the um, the self care, self wellness uh, uh, strategies in this world, and and I'm, I rejoice in that. And I'm, I'm grateful to see how the ladies take the lead. Um, just coming back to this opening slide, uh, maybe some of you are annoyed <laughs> by seeing the first strand logo, and it's not to annoy you. I know for some of you, it's a competitor. Um, so when I started my teacher training in 2016, what happened in 2018 is there was a lady called Lisa Stead, who was the organization and development lead, uh, manager for Rand Merchant Bank. And she said, Mark, do you think we could take this into the corporate space? And I was like, wow, I don't know. Let's try. You know, I'm used to teaching yogis and and like hippies and Buddhists and, you know, like Eastern philosophy and whatever. I, I don't know. Let's give it a try. So she got together 10 people that were, that volunteered within the first round group at Merchant Place. And it was live. It wasn't online. It was before the pandemic. I didn't even know what online was. And um, yeah, 10 people volunteered and I taught them the teacher training. And the amazing thing with Lisa is she created a boardroom in Merchant Place. And this boardroom wasn't for meetings. It was called the Mindfulness Presence Room. And these 10 people, when they qualified and they, they became certified, they could then, uh, throughout the day, open the room at 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 12 or 2 in the afternoon, 4 o'clock even. They all take turns. They share the responsibilities. They had a schedule. And they would literally hold space for their colleagues. So people would come in, 
they would either lead a breath meditation or they would do like an affirmation practice or they would just get people to check in with how they are like I just did now. And it provided a very beautiful and safe space for people at Merchant Place. If, if you were going through a hard time, you just go into the room and you sit with others in silence or you sit and you share, you know, if you want to, if you don't, that's fine. And it worked really, really well. And uh, the project really started to boom. Uh, so I trained another 10 people and then another 10 people. And I haven't stopped training uh, first round people. And what they do is they hold space for their organization. What happened then, the pandemic came around and um, the whole thing went online. So instead of, you know, the boardroom could only really take 20 people. And now there's probably 200, 300 people that log on uh, and listen to their colleagues. And um, it's nice to empower people within organizations to change culture. And that's pretty much what's happened. Before, before the teacher training, nobody knew about mindfulness. I think first Rand thought it was some woo-woo story. And now it's, it's almost extremely common everybody understands it everybody knows it and a lot of people and it's part of their culture so much so that lisa went on to win an innovation award um uh, from the organization and uh, a nice little uh, holiday prize for her and her partner um so uh, i also ran at apsa mindful circles with taryn opie i think maybe uh, some of you might know her or she also, Taryn and I used to facilitate every Thursday Mindful Circles for three years. And she also won an innovation award that took her to Mauritius. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's new and it's exciting because I think within wellness and HR teams, uh, the big challenge is how do we get people to take responsibility for their own health rather than it being reactive? And I always talk about brushing teeth, like we all brushed our teeth this morning. And, and you know, that, that's something we learned from our moms and our dads. Um, and maybe we hated it in the beginning and we cried and, you know, the toothpaste tasted terrible. But now most of us enjoy it. I enjoy brushing my teeth and I enjoy that fresh feeling afterwards. And I do it twice a day and I floss. Um, and my dental practice is going well, you know. My physical health practice is also going well. I exercise, I do yoga, I do breath work. But how's the mental health practice going? And for me, this has always been a sad tale. Because whenever, you, I mean, I suffered from burnout in, when was it? 2018. Um, I had a business partner and I, I, I was managing director of an advertising agency. I found out he was stealing I owed SARS a million rand. I literally crashed. I landed up in hospital. And, um, you know, the, the, the nurse said, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, get you, we'll get your head right. You know, the doctor will, will write you a prescription. And, and I thought, well, you know, thanks a lot. But uh, I, I know how to get my head right. I know what to do. And uh, there's a proactive process just like brushing my teeth, which I call a mental floss. So, I, you know, of course, as I said before, uh, psychiatry has a wonderful place and helps many people. But nobody ever gets prescribed to do 20 minutes of meditation a day or to journal or to have a mindful coffee or to go for a mindful walk or to do stretching mindfully, movement mindfully, yoga, etc. No one gets a prescription to do that. And you go to the dentist, the dentist will always encourage you to brush your teeth, right? Always. But does your therapist encourage you to do mindfulness? So a lot of the people I've trained over the years have been therapists, have been psychologists, because the world is changing. And now therapists are encouraging their, um, their patients to practice mindfulness. Therapists that really care. Um, and, and, you know... <laughs> It's not really part of the curriculum in, in, in psychology to, to, you know, there is now cognitive behavioral therapy and there's a lot of therapies that are now being brought in. And mindfulness sort of encompasses so much of all of that, right? 
it all springs out of out of mindfulness um so listen at any time you want to jump in and make a comment or ask questions you're more than welcome this uh, this whole process is very very interactive um so i'd just like to say that you know it's been a dream come true for me to see how the teacher training has, has grown and it's expanded i've taught hundreds and hundreds of people i've taught physiotherapists how do, how do they bring it into their practice i've taught audiologists and they've done research on how mindfulness reduces tinnitus. I've, you know, in the medical world, people have done research on how mindfulness reduces pain and, and contributes in pain management. I mean, what I've seen people do with, with this has been spectacular. So I learn from you just as much as you learn from me. And I think that's the power of when, if you do get to the teacher training part, that, that you bring your offering you know, you do your teach back. And it's always a, a fabulous experience um, to be part of that. And then I just sit back, I don't say anything. So for the next eight weeks, you're gonna have to listen to me, blah, blah, and, and teach you and then, you know, but obviously, I want you to be engaged as much as possible. All right. Any comments or questions? Uh, over that? Everyone? Okay. All right, super. Each class is, is, is two hours long, more or less, and it's once a week. Um, I do give homework, but don't stress. It's not like you've got to study and you've got to, you know, do a whole lot extra. What is required is that you just build in 10 to 15 minutes a day where you can sit and listen to um, an audio, right? The audio, you, you're going to have to download an app um but that's fine the app is free don't get suckered into it but we'll get there i was going to take you through um some of the slides that i that i've got going uh mr adrian jacobs who is my business partner started the, the business the mindful revolution and he got the name from a time magazine article in 2014 called the mindful revolution so back in 2014 the world started talking about it but before that you know, it was just a smattering here and there, but it really started to take ground. And people said, oh, it's just a passing fad, but it's not a passing fad. Just like brushing your teeth is not a passing fad, okay? It's here to stay. And it's always been around. I think in every single culture, it's, you know, you can find it. You can find it in every tradition, ritual, practice, drumming, dancing, uh, you know, anything done with awareness, right, is a mindfulness practice. Yes, it does. A lot of it does come from Asia. I traveled the Himalayas. I traveled India for a year. And I lived in a temple for three years. Uh, I didn't become a monk. But, um, but I learned a lot about the Asian classic philosophy of meditation and mindfulness. So what I'm going to give you in this program is, is, is an Eastern and a Western take on mindfulness, sort of two worlds converging. Obviously, the Western uh, 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 part of mindfulness is, is secular. Um, but, but the Eastern way is also very sort of methodical and, and scientific. There's no blind faith in it. It's very um, profound in its, in its approach. So the Western approach has adapted the Eastern, but, but removed uh, any sort of spiritual connotation. And made it, and science has really got behind um, the benefits of mindfulness, and uh, has has really validated some ancient ancient systems, which is really really exciting uh, to see because you, you realize that 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 the ancient world were, were pretty smart, you know they they kind of knew a lot, right? Uh, and it's nice to know. That they weren't all just you know uncivilized they were actually extremely civilized and really 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 intelligent some of these practices go back five thousand six thousand years okay but now verified by modern science um we are in a mental health revolution and the revolution is that we can take control of our own mental health um Yes, it's awesome to rely on your therapist, on your doctor, um, on a good friend, on a caring family member, whatever. 
But at the end of the day, you know, you are the person that you've been waiting for. <laughs> you know, you, you, you have to look after yourself. And if we expect other people to do it for us, we might be um, disappointed. Uh, many uh, members of my family have gone the psychiatry route and um, it's been a struggle to find the right medication. It's taken years to, to settle down on the right meds that, that agree with them, uh, which is quite a process, it's, it's quite a painful process. Um, in, in many Hello? Yeah. yeah, everyone okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, so yeah, so anyway, the, the revolution is that we can do something every day that's going to make us feel better. And not just, I mean, what is the purpose of mindfulness? It's, it's, it's to be happy. It's to have good mental health. It's, it's, it's mental hygiene. Okay. You know, we wash our bodies and, and, and I know a lot of people that I've taught, they're like, Mark, I don't know, I don't know what I was doing before the, the mindfulness program. I, 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 you know, a lot of people tell me <laughs> that if they don't do their morning, uh, they call it meds, right? Their morning meds, which is short for meditation. If they don't do their morning meds, the rest of the day just doesn't go well. And they, they say, Mark, it's like not brushing your teeth. And, and, and you get to work and you, you know, you feel, oh, I didn't brush my teeth. It feels furry. My breath stinks. I don't want to get too close to people. You know, you, you're kind of conscious, you know, if you realize you haven't brushed your teeth and now you're in a meeting uh, and, and, and people say, I didn't do my meds this morning. And I, I, I just, I don't really, I, I, it's like, I feel kind of weird. I feel almost like I just didn't start my day right. You know, so, so I'm sorry, but you will, you will start to feel this in your life. It'll, it'll, you'll notice a big difference pre the program and post the program or during the program. <laughs> and it'll be a good thing. It'll be a good thing. You know, it's like, it's like, I think it's what your mind's been waiting for. And I know a lot of you have, have already started, um, already have your own practices. Um, I've got this silly joke, like it's not really a joke. It's like a prophecy that um, according to neuroscience, uh, I think we'll be scanning each other's brains um, and judging each other's brains as much as we do each other's bodies. Um, and I've got this idea that, you know, you go on a dating site or an app and you see someone that, that looks nice and then you, you meet them at the, at the restaurant and you put this funny hat on them and then you put out your phone and, and you scan their brain. And then on your phone, it'll go, this person's brain is sexy. You know, they've got a well-developed prefrontal cortex. They've got an incredible, which means that they can focus on what you're saying. They're able to regulate their emotions. Oh, and their parietal region at the top of their head is also nicely developed, which means they have empathy. And the temporal to insular pole is also looking really good which means that they practice loving kindness. Can you imagine? I know it sounds like science fiction, but it's not because <laughs> neuroscientists are doing it today. They can literally MRI you, scan your brain, and they can tell if you are a focused person. They can tell if you're an empathetic person. They can tell if you have loving kindness and you've been developing loving kindness in your brain. And they can also tell if you're a stressed out person that's prone to fear and you're always in fight, flight or freeze because they can measure the size of the amygdala. And if the amygdala is pronounced and large, then they can see that, right? So can you imagine, you know, like someone gets a job at, um, at your organization and they're like, we don't need to see your CV. We're just going to scan your brain, you know, because <laughs> I mean, imagine like dating, it would change the whole landscape of dating. I mean, you could save you years of trouble. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's, I know it's a little joke, but actually, strangely enough, it's true. And I think this technology might become more available to the person on the street. Um, the brain and the workings of the brain is just phenomenal. Um, we have 80 billion neurons and uh, there's like this gamma, this electricity in our brain 
that's constantly moving, uh, new connections, synapses between the neurons growing, withering. And as you're listening to me, the brain is um, alive. It's fired. It's wired. Uh, and it, it, it's, it is the most advanced thing in the universe. You know, we think AI is pretty cool, but AI just copies, you know, whatever we have created. And um, your brain is remarkable. So, I mean, I don't know if any of you lift heavy things for work. And, or, you know, is your job like moving bricks around or carrying wheelbarrows throughout the day? Anybody? No? Boxes and books, yeah. <laughs> Boxes and books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but most of the day, you're probably using your brain. You know, you use your brain, answer your emails, and you have conversations, meetings, you're using your brain. So we all know like what's good for our body, but very few of us know what's good for our brain. Yet the irony is we use our brain in our, in our work. So wouldn't it be good to know how the brain works? You know, but a lot of us don't. A lot of us don't have a clue. Has anybody heard the word neuroplasticity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, I've got, you see the red line under, under neuroplasticity here in the slide. If, if I type it in word, it gives me spell error, but it, it does, see, not, not even word knows, you know, not even windows, uh, uh, Microsoft word knows the word. <laughs> okay. And it literally means that your brain has the ability to change shape. Your brain grows or it withers. And if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. There's very strong links between Alzheimer's dementia and a lack of mindfulness, massive links, more and more every year. So you want to age well, you want to age, you want your brain to be healthy in your old age, right? We all do. My mom's got dementia. It's terrible. She's only 70 years old. It's terrible. You know, and I, I do think that if she just looked after herself and, 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 and practiced mental health, more mental health practices, you know, she, she would be better. She wouldn't suffer the way she does. I do believe that. I've watched her. I, I just watched her let herself go and give up on everything that she did that was mindful. And I consider reading a book to be a mindful process. To, you know, she did pottery. She did weaving. She did knitting. She did uh, lots of things that she enjoyed. She just gave up, you know, on those things. And obviously the brain then starts to wither because you're not using it you know so it's it's important to know how to use our brain like you go into the gym and you see there's uh, weights for the arms there's leg machine there's uh, for your chest for your you know back all these different exercises work different parts of your body in the same way this program has different practices that are going to work different parts of your brain and I've always got into a debate with some, you know, schools of meditation that say, you just do this meditation and that's it. I say, no, then, you, then you're just doing your arms. When you go to the gym, you just, all you do is work out how strange would it be just have these big arms and the rest of you is untrained. We need to train the, the whole brain so that we have a holistic wellness in the brain, not just one part of the brain. Okay. Some people say, all I do is breath meditation. I say, well, that's fine. But then you're just training one part of your brain. What about the rest of your brain? You see? So you'll see that throughout this process, I'm going to be giving you different practices. And that's going to be homework. Um, yeah, multitasking, successfully lowering your IQ. We are, we are, in, a, we are in a silent pandemic, and, and that is... Um, a, uh, distraction and um, technology. You know, this is a campaign that was done by BMW. Um, terrifying. Uh, they say more deaths on the road now from texting than alcohol. Okay. Texting and driving has surpassed alcohol. Yeah. Because people are not driving. They, I mean, why do people look at their phones while they're driving? We all, we've all done it, right? Why? Anybody want to comment on why we do this? Headlines. <laughs> Sorry? 
deadlines you have to achieve deadlines deadlines <laughs> yeah we've got no time anymore kathy mm. you know we feel under pressure if we don't get to that message or answer that immediately we're going to miss something or maybe our bosses you know we don't want to seem incompetent or not available we're always on but what's that doing to our mental health and what's that mm. doing to our physical health when we, we, we might have an accident because we're looking at our phone you know mark i also feel like um even just looking at um my kids you know they it's just this can't can't be still thing mm. you know, we have to be doing at least one thing if not two three ten things at a time and there's also this feeling of I'm superhuman. Nothing's going to happen to me. Of course, I can do all of this yeah. rather than mindfully attending to the moment. And we, yeah, just slowing it down. I feel like slowing it down um, is a foreign concept nowadays. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, it's actually not possible, Nicole. Um, Harvard University did a study uh, and, and they said that if you are doing three or four things at the same time, you are lowering your IQ to that of an eight-year-old. But, but you don't even know that you don't even know because you're not there to know it. Mm -hmm. So we think we're, we think we're being smart, but we're actually dumbing down. So, so we're actually not able to do anything properly. And our attention is like a stage light in a play. We only have one light. You know, we only we can only focus on one actor at a time. Can you imagine if two or three actors got on the stage and they they were all talking at the same time? It would be chaos, right? But we think we can handle that, but we can't. We can only handle one actor. And I'm your actor now, and you're listening to me. You're right. You know, the the, the lights on me. Your awareness. You only have one light, and you, we think we can multitask because we can switch. We, the, the light moves from me to something else. But as you do that, you've lost me. And you might have lost a vital piece of information. You're also giving your long-term memory a chance to engage with your short-term memory by listening carefully. And then all of your learning, your experiences gets to engage with your mindful awareness. Right? And that's so important is to link those two parts of your brain. But if we're multitasking, and I know, oh my gosh, I mean, uh, Nicole, Temna, you know, I've, I've got a friend that works at APSA, meetings go on for three hours, um, and she's getting WhatsApp calls, uh, messages from people that are in the meeting while they're in the meeting, and emails, and she's doing her steps to, 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 to keep fit. Now, how on earth can you, can you handle a three hour meeting? You know, I mean, that's the culture that I mean, I don't know about the rest of uh, I don't know what it's like at Old Mutual and RCL and wherever, wherever else you guys work. But it just seems, you know, that sort of duration. How are you able to maintain your focus for that long? You know, it's difficult. But, Mark, if yeah. I may interject there. Sure. Um, I would. Thank you. I work for a company. I've been with them for about a year and three months now. And the main purpose for me for me to be recruited was to sit in meetings and do minutes. Okay. And and then it, I was reporting to three executives, and I'm now reporting to five. Wow. And the me and the meetings would last anything between two to four hours at a time per executive sure. um and i must be honest after 45 minutes you've actually lost me <laughs> i don't remember what you've said yeah i'm very grateful now they've they've took an eye on an idea that i suggested to them that someone like the chairperson of the meeting would refer to the agenda points that i've now created and then would say um kath please will you record the following APs and, and those are action points. Uh, so those APs be actually become the minutes and then they get distributed to people the next day to follow through and so forth. It's transformed my life completely. 
I now remember a lot more from the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that, that's a wonderful technique. Thanks for sharing, Catherine. Thank but my word, I'm, I, I'm sorry for what you've been through. It, it sounds like you got PTSD from, <laughs> from that experience. Yes, um, I do, yeah. <laughs> gosh. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I just, I, 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 would, I would die. I mean, no, that's dramatic, but I wouldn't survive in those kind of environments, knowing what I know. Um, you know, there, there are techniques of focus, like the Pomodoro technique, which, which is um, developed by Francesco Cielli, uh, a, a researcher, time management researcher, just a tomato time. And he, you know, he, he focus, he'll focus for 20 minutes on one thing and then have a five minute break and then another 20 minutes, five minute break, another 20 minutes, five minute break, and then a 20 minutes and a half an hour break. So that's a technique you know, just to focus on whatever it is you're doing, whether you're reading a book, whether you are playing with the kids, whether you are focusing on an email or a, a project, but 20 minutes at a time, uh, you know, and then taking breaks is, is essential because again, your attention span can only focus for so long and then, and then you, you get fatigued, right? So a lot of mindfulness is really about attention management and energy management because You've got to sustain your energy. And if nobody else is doing it, you've got to do it, right? You've, you've, you, you've got to know how your brain works and say, all right, uh, you know, um, this is how I'm going to do it. And uh, maybe you can be a light in, in your organization or your family, helping everyone to understand that as well. And I, I see with the kids, it's terrible. I mean, my son is on his phone all the time. And I'm constantly, I, you know, I don't want to moan, but I, I just constantly try and, you know, push him in the right direction. Say, listen, I'm talking to you. You're on your phone. Do you mind putting the phone down when I talk to you? You know, we're watching a movie. Put the phone down. But the kids can't even watch a movie these days, you know, because they're looking at their phone. If I ask him, what did you, what did you get out of the movie? He, he only watched half of it because the, the whole time he's on his phone. I mean, you know, there's nothing better in life than eating a pizza, right? And, uh, but I mean, to really enjoy it, to eat it and, and to taste it. But a lot of the time we got the TV on, you shove, we're shoveling the pizza. You don't even taste the pizza because you're watching the TV, you know? And, and, that, and a lot of weight gain and, and obesity is because there's, there's no connection between brain and body. We're just shoveling and, and we, we go past the point of feeling full because we're not actually aware that we're full. <laughs> we just keep eating, you know? So, um, yeah. So we're going to look a lot at the nervous system as well, the difference between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, sympathetic is the fight, flight, freeze, fawn state. Um, where, you know, our body uh, uh, moves into, yeah, either a bat, like we're ready for a fight or to run. Uh, it's a very ancient physiological process. Doesn't help us much when we um, sitting at a desk or in a meeting because it really is quite a, 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 a hectic experience. You, your body gets pumped full of cortisol and adrenaline. Cortisol is like a, like a painkiller. Adrenaline boosts you for that you know, to dive over the boardroom table and grab your boss by the throat. Uh, that's very good for that, but you would never do that. So anyway, <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> and the parasympathetic is known as the rest, digest and, and thrive state um, where you are happy and um, uh, you, you know, you, your lungs uh, reduce your oxygen, your heart beats slower, pupils uh, constrict and so on. A lot of these processes don't really help us. So mindfulness also is a hack. It's, it's a nervous system hack. Knowing that we have a primitive body in a modern world, our body hasn't changed in 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 150, 200,000 years, we're still the same creature. Now, if you think about humanity, you know, when, when did they invent office chairs? When, when did they invent cappuccinos? You know, when, when did, um, 
you know, when was farming started, right? I mean, if you think about 200,000 years of, of humanity, we are like, we are freaks compared to the rest of the human race. You know, we, we don't move. We sit at a desk all day. You know, humanity was all about movement and, 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 and you know, it was, we, we're not made for this world of, of office living and, and so on. Our bodies are, you know, but we still have this body that's, that hasn't changed. And we wonder why we get, you know, so stressed and so uptight and, and we suffer from mental illness. Mental illness is more prevalent now than it's ever been right ever and we think that technology has made our lives easier but it hasn't you know the, the main i think the main selling drug in this world is is antidepressant you know the, more more antidepressants are sold than any other drug and and and, and you know if you think about it like it, it wealthy people suffer you know the more you have the more you're going to suffer I think everybody, you know, mental illness is very prevalent. And more so, the, the, the leading cause of, of death in, in, in children is suicide. And more so. I mean, my friend's 18-year-old son took his life uh, four weeks ago. Terrible. Shocking. But I do believe that social media and technology has made things more complicated for our for our mind. And, and, and even television, you know, uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, 100 years ago or, or 200 years ago, 300 years ago, our ancestors didn't know what was going on in Russia and Ukraine. They didn't know what's happening in the Middle East. You know, I mean, now we turn on the TV and the whole world's problems is, is in our living room. Mm -hmm. And we worry about these things. We get stressed about these things. You know, what's happening in Middle East and Gaza, we take these things to heart. Whereas before, all we had was just our own problems and, and our own things with our own families and our own little village, our own kraal in the savannah. Now, now, we, now we know everything all over the world all, and all their problems. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's heavy and we think it's normal. But we're struggling to cope. Mark, can I just add to that one sure. thing that I've found in today's living? Before all the social media and cell phones and stuff, when people contacted you after hours, it was a matter of life and death yeah. because they had to either physically drive to your home or phone you on a landline that you must probably weren't home and didn't answer. Now with cell phones, you they're 24 seven. And if you want to pee me off, start oh. yourself with, I'm sorry to bug you on the weekend, but, and then they bug you in any case. And I like it. You, you're on standby 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just because it's so easy. And if you don't answer it on a weekend, it's like, didn't you, didn't you see myself, my number? Didn't you see it was me? And it's not right. Um, oh. You know, I, I think, us as humans are giving that control to people and I try very hard I'm lucky in my environment I can say no I will attend to this on Monday but some people aren't in that and it is it just gets too much for the human to cope with it yeah yeah Kathy mm -hmm. totally and you know I feel sorry for people with low self-worth because mm -hmm. they are the ones that will work late they are the ones that have no boundaries and they are the ones that land up with burnout. And mm. the statistic is that 40% um, of people leave their job because of burnout. 40% of staff turnover is because they burnt out. Mm. Sad. And it's always the ones that, are, that try the hardest. Mm. That, that, you know, they don't have boundaries. They, and, and, you know, if we answer our phone after hours or weekends, we are educating people that that's how you can treat me. You know, mm. and people then abuse it. So yeah. I'm to hear that you're wise enough to to take care of yourself. Yeah. That's important. Extremely. I, I mean, mm. my old man got burned out. He lost his job. Lost all his money. Sit at home. What for? Mm. I mean, uh, there's such a high percentage of people that get burnt out that, that they can't go back to work. 
and and if you stay out of work for three four months the chances of you going back to work is 20 percent 20 percent just to go back to work whatever work <clears throat> it's uh it's frightening um this lady her name is sarah lazar she is a neuroscientist at harvard university we're going to be looking at some of her work um brain scanning technology and what she found and her findings on how mindfulness affects the brain in the best of ways um the the man in the brown jacket with a funky hairdo is um his name is richard davidson he's a He's a he's a very famous neuroscientist as well, and the man in the red outfit is a monk. His name is Mathieu Ricard. Um, we'll be looking at some of the research from Richard Davidson around happiness, and and this was a particular um, research. He was he was uh, looking for happiness in the brain, and uh, staggering. Uh, um, findings we'll we'll get into that but but i think the most most important thing right now is the definition this is the mindfulness definition um and i would like you please to memorize it it you know so you know you're going to be having a a dinner party and 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 your friends will come around and you'll say, oh, I'm busy doing a mindfulness course. And they'll say, oh, really? What is mindfulness? And you don't want to sit there going, oh, uh, well, you know, um, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, you, you want to say mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way on purpose and in the present moment and as non-judgmentally, non-reactively and open-heartedly as possible. And they go, wow, OK, that's that's cool. I get it. Um, the definition is by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. Um, Dr. John uh, started uh, experimenting with mindfulness in the 1980s at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, he had remarkable results in pain management and decrease in depression of his patients. Um, and he did an eight week course, which is called the MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Program. And uh, I, be, I think he's a rock star. He's, he's quite an old man now, but uh, still going strong. And we're going to be looking at a lot of, of Dr. John's work. You know, as I said, this is a secular program. Um, although some people find it to be very spiritual, that's fine. You know, but, but let's look at the definition. It's paying attention. Now, I just got this picture because that we look at our phones and our computers all day long. But paying attention to something, one thing, in a particular way, this lady is, uh, you know, looking at these flowers or smelling these flowers, that's a particular way. And she's doing it on purpose, right? Uh, and in the present moment, in the here and now. So I like to remember it as paying, first P, paying, particular way, second P, third P on purpose. Fourth P in the present moment. Okay. So you've got four P's. Easy to remember. And then the three attitudes of mindfulness, which is non judgment, non reactive, and open hearted. The entire eight weeks is built around this quote. Mark. Is oh. non-reactive very like a predetermined for being mindful? Mm. Um, Kathy, you'll find that as you become more mindful, your reactivity will 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 reduce. Uh, so, so let's say, for example, you 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 you're driving in the traffic, and a taxi cuts you off. Um, I've always been a very aggressive uh, uh, road rage kind of guy. I inherited that brain from my mother. Um, so I would wave my fist or, or pull, pull out my middle finger and shout or whatever. And then as I got more and more into mindfulness, I, I would feel myself reacting. I'm, I might even react and then 
I might stop and, and say, well, you know, that's not the best line of action. And then with, with non-judgment, I don't judge myself. I say, okay, you know, you may have lifted the middle finger or your fist, but uh, let's not do that again. And I'm not going to think I'm a bad person for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but the more I do it, the more I catch myself. Because as, as I become more aware of my triggers, I say, ah, there's a taxi. They might cut me off. And they do. So I'd recognize that a taxi is a trigger. And, and, and it's building that awareness. But a lot of the time, because people are not as aware of their mind, the anger takes them over. And they, are, they have a knee-jerk response. With mindfulness, we want a, 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 not a reaction, a response. To be response-able, okay. respons responsible. I can get that. Yeah. To, be, to respond well. Mm. And and not to react that you will regret. Okay. So there's a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. And in people that are reactive and, and, and hot tempered, that part of the brain is underdeveloped. It's weak. So we can train ourselves so that that part of the brain regulates what comes out of our mouth. We, we catch our tongue. Mm -hmm. And mindfulness practitioners uh, enjoy the benefits of that. Can you imagine? Thank you. Yeah. That's a clear. Thanks. Okay, super. Any other comments or questions? I'm sorry, Mark, what was that part of the brain called? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's called ACC for short, anterior cingulate cortex. Yeah, thanks. That's my problem. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I, actually, my sister is a is a is an, is a, a neurobiologist, so we're both in a very similar field. She's a she's a, an amazing medical professional, and she works at Headway. It's um. It's a place in Ilovo with people with head injuries. They've, you know, been in car accidents or had accidents. Shame. And the one guy um, had damaged his anterior cingulate cortex badly. Um, and he came up to me and he said, oh, are you Michelle's brother? I said, yes. Oh, I love Michelle so much. I, I just want to have sex with her. And I, I think about her every night and da, da, da. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And I was getting so cross, but he has no filter. <laughs> so he's probably the most honest person you'll ever meet because whatever's in his mind, <laughs> whatever's in his mind, it just comes out. So he can't stop himself from saying what he's thinking. Um, and then he said, and, and you look really gay. Like he said to me, you know, like, I mean, you see, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm not gay, but thanks, you know. So, I mean, yeah, uh, it's really weird to meet someone that has absolutely no filter. But uh, they, do they know that? Do they, do they understand it? Yeah, yeah, he understands it, yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah, it, it's, uh, Kerry, have you got load shedding and your lights just went dim? Is Kerry still there? I don't know. She seems to have frozen. Yeah. Okay. Maybe a line dropped. Could be. Um, yeah, yeah. But he's got a damaged ACC. So if we develop that, then, you know, we, we stay cool, calm, and collected. Without it being developed, if it's weak, we are the opposite. We are triggered, and we're all over the place. And emotional, uh, our emotions take us over. And we can't regulate. Uh, sorry, Mark. What is the second word? Anterior? Singulate. A uh, singulate. Yeah, cortex. It's C I N G U L A T E. Singulate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a small part just behind the prefrontal cortex. Okay. But it's a regulator, it's a switch. Mm. It's an important switch. 
Okay, we'll just see if Kerry comes back in. I hope she does. Mark, uh, that's the part we, we, we describe it in our um, Lumina session as it's your brain is like that and oh. the ACC is in there and the, the saying, you flip your lid. Um, <laughs> it's when you flip your lid and yes. you've got no control anymore because then that part is open and it just goes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. I like that. Flip your lid. Yeah. I'm going to use that Kathy, if I can steal that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we pay attention in a particular way on purpose and in the present moment. How do people feel when, uh, when they think of the future? What future? <laughs> yeah, tomorrow morning, uh, next week. Anxious. Anxious. Yeah. Fears. Wow. Fears. Fears. Mm. Why? Why did no one say excited, enthusiastic? Oopsie. I was going to say hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Catherine. But uh, there we go. I've just exposed negativity bias. Mm. Um, our brains are not wired for happiness. And, and when we think of an uncertain future, we feel anxiety more than we feel hopeful. Now, there are some people that feel excited or hopeful. That's fine. But the majority of people are anxious. I always ask these questions in big groups and I say 95% of the answer is anxious. Um, and how do, we, how do we feel when we think of the past? It depends. Sometimes it's a lot of regrets or shame or otherwise it can be thankful. Sure, sure. Yeah, it could be regret, uh, shame, guilt, or thankful. Yeah. But still, the, the most, the, the best place for us. Kerry, you disappeared for a minute there. Are you okay? Yeah, sorry, the electricity just went out. I think there must have been a short somewhere, but okay. it's all sorted now. All right, yeah, you, you you were kind of in the dark, but smiling. And yeah. <laughs> I was asking if, if everything was okay, and you just kept on okay. smiling. So I thought, okay. <laughs> we thought you were in meditation. <laughs> no, <laughs> not this time. All right, super. So, so here and now is, is, is the best place to be for our mental health. Because if we are worrying about something, maybe it's your job, maybe your relationship, maybe your health, your mind tends to ruminate and get stuck there. Or you have regret, longing, you wish for the past and your mind gets stuck there too. Again, not good for our mental health. So the more that we stay with a dark cloud of anxiety or regret or guilt, the more that impacts our mental health until the hole is so big that we can't get out. You know, I went through a divorce recently, horrible experience, terrible. I have such regrets and I miss my wife and I wish I could make it right, but I can't. And there's sometimes where I lie in bed and I just feel this overwhelming sense of sadness and dread and, and, and hopelessness. And then I go, all right, enough now. Let's, let's shift our attention to something else. And I'm grateful that I can. But if I, if, if I didn't practice mindfulness, I don't think I could do it as successfully as, as I can do it. And if I, if I couldn't do it, you know, what's next? Depression, what my dad went through, etc. you know? And I do believe that this is why mindfulness is essential to our mental health. Because we then 
you know, it's like going to gym and let's say uh, 50 kilograms is really heavy, right? And you want to lift that 50 kilograms above your head, but you can't. You go to gym and you can lift five and then month you lift 10. Then another month you get to 15. And then after maybe a year, yeah, you lift up that 50 kgs because you built up the muscle. Mindfulness is the same. You can't expect just to snap out of your depression or your anxiety or your fears or your overwhelm or your loss or your grief. You, you can't just snap out of it. You have to build up into that place where you can then eventually do that. And if you know, but you've got to start somewhere, right? And it's the same with your muscles and your brain is a muscle and it's the same thing. The more you train your, your mind and your brain, the more you're going to be able to let go of what happened or let go of anxiety and fear and just be in the now. Does that make sense? Mark, are you going to explain to us when you spoke about the two different nervous systems? Mm. One thing that's always interests me is why is it so easy for some people to be happy and others not? Yeah. Uh, that baffles me. There'll be people in the same scenario, the same background, the same history, the same challenges, but the one can climb out of the hole so much quicker than the other one. Yeah. And I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand it. Yeah, well, you know, Kathy, it's our conditioning mainly. Um, and it's also epigenetics in the in class three, not next week, but the week after we're going to look, we're going to look at epigenetics, that some people are, are born stressed, they inherit yeah. stress in the brain. And it's, a, it's physical. And it comes from if, if, if you can't manage your stress, you pass that on to your, your, your unborn child. And they can't manage stress too. And, and it's a physical thing. It's called epigenetics. Um, so yeah, it, it's just so important for us to manage our stress because we don't, especially all the young moms, you know, if you pass that on to your kids. I was born stressed. I mean, I started having panic attacks at school. Um, before exams, I'd be throwing up. All the boys would run into the rugby field. I'll be in the bathroom, you know, throwing up because I was anxious. None of the other boys were throwing up. They were happy to run on the field. I was terrified. I was terrified of exams, you know? Why? I grew up in a loving home. There was no craziness going on, but I had severe anxiety. It's, you know, but I mean, Kathy saying that, it, it's not a, it's, it's, it's it, because of neuroplasticity, Anything can be changed. Anything can be healed. And that's the beautiful thing. If a guy like me can keep going and stay alive after what I've been through, anybody can. You know? Seriously. Um, so we've looked at the first four Ps. And now we're going into the attitudes. Open heart non-judgment, non-reactivity. For the, for, the, for the next three, four classes, we're going to be looking at non-reactivity. We will then move into open-heartedness and then into non-judgment, the last two classes. So that's why I say the entire program is built around this quote. It's a very important quote. There's lots of quotes. There's lots of um, definitions of mindfulness. But I like Dr. John's the most because he is recognized as the leading professional in the field of mindfulness. And there are lots and lots of wonderful mindfulness teachers. But I think Dr. John is, is the most famous, John Kabat-Zinn. Um, and, and you'll get to know him. Um, so please, uh, I'm going to share the definition with you. What, what I'm going to do is um, I'll, make a, I'll make a WhatsApp group, if, if you don't mind. And um, I'll, I'll close it. So I'll be the admin. 
and uh, every day I'll send you one or two messages. So I will send you this tomorrow um, on on WhatsApp, if that's okay. If any of you don't want to be on the group, please DM me privately. So the cycle of mindfulness, and, and this is, has anybody here been taught um, that, that meditation is about clearing your mind? In the beginning, that's what I thought. Okay. Anybody else heard, heard of that? <laughs> yes, I have. All right, super. Uh, okay, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a good thing to, to, to be taught. Um, mm -hmm. I used to use cuss words in the past, but I'm trying to be mindful. Um, okay. you, you can't clear your mind. Um, and um, yeah, it's, you know, that's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is when you're focusing on one thing. Like, let's say we did a breath meditation at the beginning of the class. As we're doing it, your attention wanders to something else. And that's normal. Okay, if, if someone tells you that meditation is about clearing your mind and you keep on trying to do that, you're going to be grossly disappointed at yourself. And you're going to think, I, I can never do this. And you're going to think everybody else can do it and I can't and I must be crazy. Because that's how I felt. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anyone saw, what was it, Julia Roberts in Eat, Pray, Love, where she's in the ashram and she's like having that inner dialogue with herself. Everyone's, everyone looks so spiritual and they're all meditating and my mind's chaotic. And, you know, but actually everyone's mind is, is like that. <clears throat> when I was in the Himalayas, there are monks and nuns that meditate almost all day long. And when they place their mind on, on one thing, um, their attention doesn't actually wander. That's quite profound. Um, I don't think it's, it's possible in, a, in, a, in, our, in our life, unless you devote yourself entirely to, you know, to the process. Um, and they're blissful. They don't want to watch Netflix. They, they don't want to like hang out at the pub or go for chai lattes. They, they're quite happy just to sit and, and, you know, focus on their breathing because they have ecstatic states of mind. They, they, it's very well documented in the Eastern literature. They call it jnana, jnana. It's a Sanskrit word. It means ecstasy, like blissful. And there's many levels of bliss of, of when the mind is, is resting without any other thoughts. Okay, that's a little Mark, bit. Of, yes. Can I ask you something? Are we going to get any notes? Yes, yes, Anna-Marie. Um, I will be okay. sharing uh, notes with you as well. Okay, but thanks. It's, it's mainly going to be, it's mainly going to be video and okay. quotes that I'll be uh, uh, sharing with you via WhatsApp. Okay. Okay, I, I like to make yeah. videos. I, I just don't know if anybody reads anymore, but I do have research notes that I'm going to be sharing with you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, I think then Nicole came up and said her ACC is her challenge. I think we, we, um, I have to fast forward to that non judgmental. I'm thinking of these monks sitting there for the whole day meditating, <laughs> and I think, what the hell? Why are you even here? Yeah. It's a waste of a laugh just sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> so I don't, I don't get that. Maybe at the end I'll understand that. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Kathy, their philosophy is when they can truly find inner peace, uh, then that's the only point where they can share it with others. Um, they believe that everybody else is like the blind leading the blind. Uh, I don't believe that. You know, I believe that, that we've got to do our best, even even though my mind is uh, chaotic and unruly, I still try and share the information as I've learned it. Mm. And and I, I think, you know, I think even therapists and psychologists, some of them are the most messed up people I've ever met, you know, <laughs> because they got into it to heal themselves, right? It's the... You, you, you teach what you need to learn, right? 
Mm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so anyway, I'm probably one of the most messed up people you guys will ever meet. I don't profess to be a guru or, or anybody special. Um, so your attention wanders and then you gently invite that back to the object. Now, every time you do that, let's say you, you, you're reading a book and you, you know, then your mind wonders, ah, where am I? I'm reading the same page three times, four times. That's okay. Then keep coming back. Every time you bring your mind back, you are doing their work. You are doing, you're lifting weights for your brain. Every time you bring your attention back to what you were doing, that is building your prefrontal cortex and also making the ACC stronger. So that's what we do. It's brain gym. It's mental fitness training. Your mind wonders, you bring it back. Your mind wonders, you bring it back. And you don't shout at yourself. Okay, non-judgment, open-heartedness, and non-reactivity. Remember those three? So if you've got a little puppy dog and you're training your puppy, the dog wanders off. And then you go, Kom terug, Waza, come back. And then the dog comes, right? And then the dog goes off and does it again. And then you say, come back. But that's what we do with our mind. And it sounds pretty weird, like that's what we do with our mind. Oh, so am I not my mind? So who's bringing my mind back? <laughs> so this is where it gets tricky, right? Because in, in science, they call it meta awareness, the ability to know what your mind is doing. But then who's me knowing what my mind is doing? So it's interesting, it gets into this quandary, like there's two parts of your mind, there's subjective mind, which I like to call the puppy mind, and the observer, which is the wise old owl. And you know this, you have this all day long. Oh, I, I really would love an extra glass of wine, or I'd really love that third chocolate brownie. And then the subjective mind wants it, and the observer mind or objective mind says, no, enough now. It's just like the angel and the devil on your shoulder, you know? I want to do it. And then the angel goes, no. But in, we don't talk about that in this course. We just say there's an observer and there's a subjective part. So as we are uh, training, the observer is training the subjective mind. And we are making the trainer, the observer, stronger. And we are making the subjective mind more obedient. Okay? It's training. Like training your puppy all right now in, in 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 people who are reactive or aggressive or out of control their subjective mind is 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 very well developed and their observer mind is a weakling because the observer mind has no uh no control uh, you know hardly any control they are just bound by their desires and their aversions and there's no equanimity. So we're taking control. And the way we take control is the mind wonders and you go, okay, fine, come back. Or your mind gets lost in grief and, and, and regret and you go, okay, all right, enough, come back. You know, what's in front of me? Is it, what sounds are outside? Let me move my awareness into my body. You know, let me shift my focus to something else. And you get good at that. George Lucas says your focus determines your reality. So whatever you focus your mind on becomes your reality. Um, I often use the analogy that our, um, our, our mind is like a broken radio. And, and it just, you know, the dial just keeps moving from station to station. And some stations we don't like. And some stations we do. But because there's no, because it's broken, we don't have the control. But wouldn't it be nice to focus on the station that you want to listen to? 
and, and keep it there, keep the dial there. But it just keeps flicking to one thing to another, like a broken radio. I want to hold that dial in place and I want to focus on the music that I want to listen to. I want to listen to the thoughts that I want to listen to rather than whatever happens, you know, is going on. And that, and that, that is focus. Interruption science. I mean, the, the amount of distraction that we're having to deal with is remarkable. Right. Gloria Mark from the University of California says that we are interrupted every 11 minutes and it takes an average of 25 minutes to return to the original task. She goes on to say in a normal nine hour working day, we are uh, two hours of that day. We are either in distraction or recovering from distraction. Two hours out of nine hours. And there's internal distractions as well. She says that 47% of our distractions are internal. Looking at your phone, uh, maybe thoughts arise, you know, you're busy focusing and off you go on, a, on the broken radio tangent. And I, I love this quote because distraction at its core is this confusion about what matters. Confusion about what matters. Okay, now to some technical stuff. Um, I will send you uh, a WhatsApp to join Insight Timer. And I'll give instructions on how to find me. Um, and then we make friends. And then, and then I, can, I can kind of see what you're meditating. I can check in on you. I can come and I can see, oh, wow, you know, Rose sat this morning and did a did the breath meditation. Well done. So I can kind of like make sure that you're doing your practice. Um, if you don't like that, then let me know. But I think it's cool because if you know Big Brother's watching, your coach is watching, right? You're going to you're going to be inspired. You don't want Mark to moan at you. You don't want Mark to say, hey, I haven't seen you on the app in the last three days. What's going on? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to download the app. Has anybody got the app? Yeah, Nicole? You, you yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Kerry, you, you've got it. You didn't have to pay. I, uh, no, no, just the free version. Okay. Don't get sucked into paying. Yeah. Uh, if you it's, pay, it's, it's nice. the name of the app Insight. Insight Timer. Oh, I will send you a link. Uh, okay. Yeah, I will send you a link. Um, and then my audio practices are on the app. Now the app is really cool because if you're doing the teacher training part or you want to get your two hundred hours, um, it's going to take a long time to get the two hundred hours you're not going to get it in the next 14 weeks. It'll, you know, unless you, you do like a week's retreat or, or more, you know, like that kind of thing. But so it normally takes about a year and then people, um, so as you are listening to audio, it, it adds your time, the cumulative. And also you don't have to listen to the audio. Yes, I have audio practices, but you might listen to my voice once, twice and think, all right, I know what this guy's talking about. I'm going to do this on my own. I don't need to listen to his voice. I just put the timer on and it goes bing and it's quiet and, it, and it, it's just a timer. And I use that quite a lot. And then it just adds and adds and adds to the point where one day you look at your stats on the app and it says you've got your 200 hours. You send me a screenshot and that's part of your qualification. Why is this important? Well, we can talk about swimming, right? We can talk about swimming for hours and hours and hours. But if you want to swim like Chad Leclo, you know, a degree is not going to help you. You've got to jump in the pool. 
And a lot of people study mindfulness. They, they'll get like a degree in mindfulness. To me, that doesn't matter much. It's about 5% of it. Mindfulness is a practice. If you're going to facilitate and teach mindfulness or, or, or talk about it, you've got to practice it. So, yeah, the classes are important. These classes are important. But the most important part of the program is when you wake up in the morning or at night, when you find your time to do your practice. That's the most important part. Or during the day when you have a coffee or a meal or something and you enjoy the practices as I give them to you. That's, that's the important part. That's the work that you do. I'm just here to inspire you and to say, come on, let's, let's get going, you know, uh, make it a daily habit. Uh, even if it's just for eight weeks, then afterwards you can throw it away. But I'm pretty sure that after the eight weeks, it's going to become a part of your life. And even if it's for five minutes a day, right? So that's why it's important. Um, to practice okay and then next week when when you check in you check in how was your practice and and we'll all know if you haven't been because you'll be like oh i didn't i needed one i needed to you know it's a bit embarrassing when you when you when you got to check in because you you're accountable to everyone now on this platform Next week, we're going to hear uh, you. Yeah, Kerry? Sorry. Um, how do you work the time for those of us who have already been using the app? So to get those 200 hours, how do you how do you count it? So, Kerry, I'm happy that, that, that whatever hours you have accumulated will go towards your total. Okay. Because you've been practicing. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> If you do a yoga class, put on your timer. I consider yoga to be a mindfulness practice. If you do breath work, put on your timer. If you are um, doing a mindful walk, put on your timer. Whatever it is that you're doing, if you are doing it according to this quote, that's mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're not sure, then give me a call or, or send me a message and say, I'm doing this mindfully. Is it considered to be mindfulness? Now, some people say, Mark, I've just watched a two hour movie mindfully. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not going to accept that. Okay. I, I want, I want you. Yes, you can. Of course you can watch a movie mindfully, but I'd rather it be a, a dedicated uh, on purpose practice like you got a special little room or you got a special little mat or you, you know, it's, it's like on purpose, right? And, and yes, of course you can watch a movie mindfully. Of course, you know, um, I, I like to eat popcorn mindfully. I mean, we'll get into that, you know, um, you can eat mindfully, drink mindfully, um, even gardening mindfully. Right. So if there's if there's any confusion about there's something that you do, it's a ritual, maybe you, you play piano or guitar or something like that. You know, I consider that an incredible uh, mindful action. So if there's any confusion around mindful practice, please um, let me know. So there's your stats. Uh, you, you know, once you start to play with the app, you'll find um, where everything is and uh, your hours will, will build up. Um, the, the, what we're also going to do is journal. So you might have um, an app on your phone or what I like is a real book. And I try and journal six times a day. Um, lately, I've uh, been not great. I've been doing two, three. See, when I say not great, let's not be judgmental. Um, so I do two or three entries a day. 
looking at non-reactivity. Uh, did I give the middle finger in the traffic today? Or did I manage to catch myself? So, so to, to start tracking your conduct and look at your day and say, how reactive was I today? Or how non-reactive was I today? Celebrate the non-reactivity and don't be judgmental or beat yourself up for those moments where you were reactive. It's just a tracking process, like what, way less, you know, where you track your calories. You're not going to, at the end of the day, cry and feel guilty because you cheated. You're just going to say, okay, well, it wasn't a great day. Um, went over what I was supposed to tomorrow. I've got to just try better. I will send a little video on what non-reactivity is as well. Some people get confused. They're like, I don't understand what you mean by non-reactivity. I will unpack that over the next couple of days. You see, I think this is the most profound slide for me. Is you get to a point where, like this morning, you know, like I was just thinking, oh God, you know, things are such a mess. And then I, I, I stop and I go, hang on, I'm having a thought that things are such a mess. Things are not a mess. It was just a thought. If I, if I start to identify with that thought, wow, then that's going to get messy. Like this guy, I notice that I'm having a thought that I'm not coping with this, or I'm not coping with this. So the observer is going, oh, wow, I noticed that I'm, I, I just thought everything's a mess, but it's not. You see, the subjective mind is going, everything is a mess. You don't want to live in the subjective mind. You want to live in the observer mind. The observer mind rises above the drama. It's like either being on the roller coaster or standing and watching the roller coaster and having a good time and going, wow, the roller coaster is so cool, you know. But if you're in the roller coaster, it's like terrifying. Okay. It's a, this is a little bit difficult to get. Does everyone understand this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very important for, for our mental health. It's very, very essential. And this is what people don't understand, guys. You are so lucky, actually, to have this awareness now and, and to be interested in this subject. Because mental health is so misunderstood and, and the benefits of, of training in proactive mental wellness techniques is so misunderstood. Gosh. Um, so we're going to start off with a mindful coffee exercise for the next week. Um, or mindful tea. Does everybody drink tea or coffee here? Like I don't a, drink tea. Okay. <laughs> so I know some people drink herbal tea. I drink both. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So, so that's if, one. <laughs> you've got more opportunity. <laughs> so I like to make a cup of coffee and then just sit outside and drink that coffee and not look at my phone and just sip it and feel the warmth and smell. Try and bring all your senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, you know, um, bring it all in when you drink your coffee or your tea. Okay. And then just be with it. Be with your tea or your coffee. Pay attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and as non-judgmentally, non-reactively and open-heartedly as possible. And not for your coffee or your tea. I mean, you could think, oh, this tea is not as nice as the other tea I had yesterday. But it's really about 
you could be sitting and thinking, oh, I'm so useless. I, I've been sitting drinking my tea, but I've been reaching for my phone or I got distracted by my dog or, you know, it's about you to be non-judgmental to you, non-reactive to you, open-heartedly to you. John kabat says mindfulness is a intimate love affair with yourself. It's falling in love with yourself. It's being kind to yourself. Giving yourself a break. You know, every time we judge ourselves, we reactive with ourselves, we closed to ourselves, we just come back and go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to open my heart. I'm going to love who I am. That's the beautiful thing. It's, it's a, it's such a, it, it, it's really about self-love and self-compassion. Um, Mark, a question on that yeah. mindfulness coffee. So if we spend five minutes or 15 minutes having that cup of coffee, we then go record it on the app as yeah. the five or the 15 minutes. You can, absolutely, yeah, 100%. Okay. 100%. Every little... You know, it's it's good it's good to get in, you know used to just recording uh, your practice. Mm. Um, I like going to do a yoga class because sometimes a yoga class is like an hour, hour and a half. You know, there's a lot of time. If I had to meditate for an hour and a half, I think my I'd be grumpy. Like it's just too long. But 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 like even if you go to gym or you exercise mindfully, that that's possible. Yeah. Then I want to create a WhatsApp group. Um, I don't have all of your numbers. I'm going to put my number in the in the chat. So what I would like you guys to do is just send me a message and say it's me, and then I can add you, and then I'll <laughs> make I'll make a group. Well, can you have um, um, a mindful conversation? Or not you can of course you can yes but then you got to sit down with somebody and say right um we are going to have a mindful conversation and we're going to practice active listening okay yeah okay. sometimes the conversation is mindful and then it becomes unmindful but it, it it's very possible to have a mindful conversation if it's if it's i think if both parties are aware um, and doing it in an active way. If that makes any sense. Okay. Um, sorry, Mark. So on that, like with uh, coaching, which is very mindful, active yeah. listening, questioning, will that count as well? It will. Yeah. If you are if you are coaching, it is extremely mindful. You've got to be present. Yeah. Um, for example, for the last hour and a half I haven't been doing anything else I haven't been looking at my phone I've had to be very present with you guys and that's a mindful process um, and then you get a certificate uh, especially for the teacher trainers you will get a certificate after the eight weeks if you are not doing the teacher training um, but the teacher training certificate uh, is after the 13 or 14 week process. It is CETA accredited and it's also recognized by the Health Professions Councils of South Africa, the HPCSA. So medical people get uh, 14 CPD points for attending the program. Amazing, right? Are there any medical people that are looking for CPD points here? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, Anna Marie, great, wonderful. Well, um, so you, um, uh, 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 what's her name again? Um, I go on blank. Um, no, it'll come to me. So, um, but aren't you friends? What's her name? Uh, Hel not Helene, Helene's mom. Uh, um, Ansi. Ansi, 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 that's it. Ansi. Yes, she she actually referred Ansi. me to you. Yes, Ansi. Okay, yes. Ansi, Ansi, we just got Ansi's uh, CPD points organised for okay. her. Okay. So yeah, um, that was cool. Um, 
Oh, are you in the same profession, uh, Anna Marie? Uh, I'm actually a clinical social worker. Okay, wonderful. Yes, but I actually do the same work as Ansi. Fantastic. She is the most amazing person. I love her mm. to um, Yes, I also attend her meditation. Really? Christian meditation classes, yes. Wow, fantastic. Mm. So you see where you can take it. I mean, Christian meditation classes, mm -hmm. that's yeah, I mean, if you're reading the Bible, if you're reading, uh, uh, you know, the, the spirituality is a mindful, mm -hmm. mindful process. Mm -hmm. I had a, a Muslim client who uh, I taught mindfulness to, and he says, you know, when I pray now, uh, I I'm really feel connected to God because my mind's not wandering all over the place, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, I'm just taking a snapshot of there. So yeah, you can you can put your number in the chat as well if you don't want to, if you haven't messaged me, that's fine. Um I've just messaged you. All right, super. Thank you. Um what else? Just trying to think. Yeah, as I said next week, um I'd say four or five minutes I'm gonna give you to hear a little bit about you. And um, I think it's important, right, uh, that we get to know each other well. And you'll find that after the eight weeks or the 14 weeks, you'll be like good friends. And, you know, um, it's a beautiful process. We're going to connect well, deeply. But next week will be a little bit about your mental health journey and how you got to mindfulness. And why mindfulness? So you might want to think about it. A uh, little bit of prep. You don't have to use the full five minutes next week. You know, you might just maybe opening up and telling your story to strangers is not your thing. I get it. Um, but for those people that want to facilitate and teach mindfulness, you've got to be a bit vulnerable, I found. You've got to be a little bit able to share a bit of you um, mm. because that makes a great facilitator when i started working for mindful revolution i was actually rejected i was kicked out uh, that was 10 years ago because I, I started uh, uh, the facilitators at that time were all like good looking and sexy and they 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 were like had no they, they came across as being perfect like they had no any issues or anything right so they had this image of portraying absolute mental fitness wellness and physical beauty and i came along going yeah i'm i'm i like i've i'm suffer from anxiety i've had panic attacks my dad's suicide and then the other facilitators were like, ooh, no, we don't want to hear your, the, all of this, all your problems, yeah. And I just thought, you know, if I'm just authentic, if I, if I just come across vulnerable, um, I found that works better. And then in the long run, then I got kicked out of Mindful Revolution and then uh, I started working with R&B and then Mindful Revolution contacted me again and said, you're doing such amazing work. What is your secret? And I was like, vulnerability, you know, just, just be authentic, just be real, be a real person. Uh, so that's my style. I just, I just feel it's, it's important that, you know, the more real we are is a practice too, you know, um, and makes, makes a good facilitator to talk from your own life experiences is, 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 is also very powerful when you facilitate or, and when I, when I talk about it being a teacher, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, maybe it's meeting someone at Starbucks and talking about mindfulness to help them with their problem in their life, you know, that kind of thing. You don't have to be like in front of a big audience and be this big teacher thing. It's just really sharing the information skillfully. Um, and then we change the world in, in that way. Yeah, I, you know, if you told me uh, 10 years ago that I'd be in the mental health game, teaching mindfulness for a living, I'd tell you that you're mad, 
Like there's no ways, right? Um, but the world has changed and I've been part of the most incredible change. And I've got to pinch myself sometimes because for me, it's been a dream come true. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, are there any comments or questions? Mark, I can just vouch for you on that one. We use mindful revolutions in our organization and there's quite a few facilitators. And whenever I used to advertise the same Mark's running the session, they're like, great. And I asked them why great. And they all said it's because Mark's so human. And um, the way that you shared, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, now, and I mean, we're going to share next week in any case, but I'm a very optimistic person and um, I always see the sun. If inside. And then I think, now where am I going to get these stories to share with the people? But I think that you don't have to have the stories. You must just be authentic about it, that um, that will deliver it. So it does. If you arrive authentically and you just share your, it, it does work. It clicks automatically with your audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. And, and it also opens up for their ability to share. <laughs> Because now they feel safe with you, and mm -hmm. um, and and you open the door, you know, and uh, and then it creates a, a, a beautiful sharing platform. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. That's very kind. I um, I really appreciate what you just said. Mm. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> yes, I think Mark, if you are so vulnerable, people tend to be more relaxed, and they don't have to pretend. They can just be who they are. Oh, absolutely. So they would definitely easier share their story. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So so next week is 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 a chance to practice that. Okay. Um and and and, and in a safe space. So it, it's creating a safe space as part of a facilitation process. And uh, what we call in mindfulness holding space. Um to be able to hold space. Yeah. So you're gonna have five minutes of holding space and telling us a little bit of your your story. And then we'll dive back into the info the week after. <clears throat> so um, if you haven't WhatsApp me, please WhatsApp me. Don't forget. So I got I can start that group. I'm gonna start sending you video material tomorrow and and the definition and the coffee. And you, you don't have to worry. I'm going to basically give you everything, all your homework on a silver platter. Okay, so don't end the class now and go, what did he say? I don't know. Where do I find the app? And I'm going to share it all with you. Okay. Um, there's also research I will share with you too um, that you can read. I'll email it through really interesting scientific uh, articles, etc., that I've managed to find. Um, what else? I think that's it. Yeah. Mark, next week, are you going to like critique us and say and advise us? No, no, but next... you should. Uh, I want you to, I want you to tell me, no, uh, don't do that. Do that. No, it's just getting to know you, Kathy. It's just okay. getting to know you. That's all. Okay. I will I will critique you in good time. Don't you worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't Super. you worry. I will. And we will all critique each other. That's the thing. If you're doing the teacher training, when that time comes, you get your stage, you get your 30 minutes. And then we I, I, I sit with the clipboard and make notes, but you all contribute to your constructive uh, uh, feedback for that presentation. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it's just praise, praise and worship each other, you know, Oh, I love that so much. That was brilliant. But you could have just done that one little thing better, you know? Um, so it just, it just makes, and there's stuff that I miss that other people pick up about the teach back. So it's important that we all get involved in in the feedback for those teachbacks mm. okay thanks okay all right everyone um i see it's almost nine that's pretty good 
we're sticking to time. I'll try to be mindful of time. I don't want to keep you up all night. Um, great. Thanks, Nicole, for your comment. And yes, thanks, everybody. Lovely meeting you. Really looking forward to the rest of the journey. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Kathy. And um, take care. And then we'll see you guys next Monday. But in the meantime, every day I'm going to share with you the practice on Inside Timer and where to find it. And if you feel confused or you don't know what's going on, just send me a message and say, Mark, I need I need help. I, I'm battling with an app or I'm, I'm struggling with something. Don't just sit there in silence and, and, and suffer. You know, let, let's get you going. Let's get you sorted out, okay, if it's not working. All right. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, ladies. Have your Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Thanks.